Um, well, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, um, my topic today is the blessings of a godly mother. And um, <clears throat> who can tell me, have any of y'all, or who has been raised by a godly mother? Okay, all right. So, just, does anybody want to share with me, like, something that sticks out to them that says, you know, this is a blessing that I can say, because my, mo my mother was a godly mother, you know, what, what's a blessing that you can recall that you feel like because your mother was a godly mother? How have you benefited from it? Growing up in the church. Yes. So maybe like you feel like you might be faithful today because of your mother? Okay. <coughs> so motherhood is the highest honor a woman can have. It's a role given only to women, and yes, unfortunately, that has to be said. Um, when considering the ways of the world and the blatant attacks on Christianity and morality, God-fearing homes with godly mothers are more important now than ever before. I am pretty sure that most of us never thought that we would have to sit here today and explain what it is that makes us women. But this is the world we're living in today, and this is the world that our kids are growing up in today. Um, so before I begin, I want to tell you, I was not raised by a godly mother. I'm not saying my mother was a bad mother. She did the best thing, the best that she could. Um, the times that we did go to church faithfully or attend church faithfully, it was um, because of um, my stepfather at the time. And as soon as that marriage ended, so did our church attendance. So, um, you know, I am trying to raise children in a godly home, um, but I think it would be wrong for me to stand here and say, this is why my children are blessed, because I'm a godly mother. You know, these are the reasons why. It feels wrong. So the context that we're coming today from is going to be just examples that we have of godly mothers in the Bible. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So with any lesson, before we begin, we want to define some terms, right? So I feel like we should define what a blessing is. Um, most of us can name blessing, um, and the Merriam-Webster defines blessing, defines blessing as being a thing conducive to happiness or welfare. So anything that produces a positive outcome or promotes joy and well-being can be considered a blessing. If we're defining what godly means, um, even the world's definition of godly means rever have a reverencing, or reverencing God and his character and laws, living in obedience to God's commands from a principle of love to him and reverence of his character and precepts, religious, righteous, conform to God's law. And then, of course, we're going to define a mother. And a mother is simply a female parent. This is whether you're a biological parent, where, whether you're a grandmother raising a child, any woman who has the responsibility of raising a child could be could fill this role. <coughs> so we're going to go over six blessings um, or outcomes of being raised by a godly mother or what a godly mother can teach their children. Obviously, this is not an extensive list. Um, because I think that if we were just to make a list of all the blessings in our lives that we have from godly mothers, we'd be here all day. Um, let's see. Turn to Exodus chapter 2 with me. I'm going to get there as well. Technology, technology. I probably could have flipped there quicker in my Bible. Okay, so while, while y'all are getting to Exodus chapter 2, <coughs> number one, a godly mother, <coughs> excuse me, a godly mother is going to show her children 
that their identity is in Christ. Exodus chapter 2, we learn of the birth of Moses. What was his mother's name? Yeah. <laughs> That's hard to spell the first time. <laughs> All right, so in Exodus chapter 2 from these, pa these passages, we know that his mother Jochebed hid him for three months because of the king's edict to kill all Hebrew uh, boys. She concealed him for three months. Once she could no longer conceal him, <clears throat> she concocted a plan in order to preserve his life. That's what we do for our kids, right? We concoct plans to preserve their life. Due to her clever scheme, she saved him from certain death, and she was allowed to continue to nurse him until he was weaned. And then he, she gave him to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter. But still, it's very clear that his mother, Jochebed, made sure to instill in him to acknowledge the one true God. He was living in Pharaoh's house that was full of idolatry. <coughs> Um, after all those years being raised in the house of Pharaoh, he still considered himself a Hebrew, even choosing to suffer with his people rather than enjoy the life of luxury under the roof of the king of Egypt. Um, let's see. Did I say Exodus chapter 2? Yeah, that's right. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, since I kind of summed that up, actually I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. So verse 23 says, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Is this particularly talking about, whose faith is this talking about in this, in this particular verse? His parents, right? Verse 24, By faith, Moses, when he, has, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So it's interesting to me, um, you know, the influence <clears throat> that we as parents can have on our children. <clears throat> Excuse me. For him to be living in Pharaoh's house, but his parents had such, a, such an influence on him still that he still chose to serve God. Um, and something that I had never noticed before, and as many times as we've read this hall of faith here, um, about his parents, that is also noted about him. In verse 23, it says of his parents, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And then in verse 27 of Hebrews 11, it says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Do you think that that was an influence of his parents? <clears throat> That's something interesting I had never picked out before. There's something profound about a mother's influence on her children. Sometimes it's a case that a woman's husband and a father and the father of her child is either not supportive or not in the picture at all. And sometimes we can feel like um, the task of raising godly children is going to be impossible. But... If you feel that way, let's be reminded of Abijah, Hezekiah's mother. Do you remember who her husband was? 
No. That's the grandfather. King Ahaz. Ahaz was evil, full of idolatry, but his mother <coughs> wasn't. And because of his mother's influence, he became a great king, and he stood for what was right, and he did some really, really hard things. Um, and, you know, so much today in this world, so many kids are being raised by women. Fathers are not around. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't still have a great influence and raise our kids in the Lord. So, you know, how can we today ensure that our children will recognize their true identity? <clears throat> in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a, a people for his own possession. That's the ESV version, says for his own possession. The KJV says we are a peculiar people, so we're people that are different. So if we want to instill a true identity in our children, they need to understand that their identity is in Christ, not with this world. We belong to him, and we are married to Christ. When we're married, do we not take on a different identity? We wear wedding bands. Why do we wear wedding bands when we, when we get married? Is that for us? <laughs> yes, and expensive, and we know, but that's not really for us, right? Maybe the style would be for us, but it's to indicate to the world that we belong to someone, right? We are taken, <coughs> um, and now that we're taken, we're going to act differently towards the world, right? And this is how we need to teach our children um, to view our identity in Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2, we know this by heart probably, maybe not by heart, but you know where I'm going, be not conformed to this world, but be a living sacrifice. And this indicates that setting ourselves apart from the world is going to be difficult at times. It's going to be sacrificial. We cannot shelter our kids from the fact that sometimes living a life in Christ is going to be hard. And we need to prepare them for situations like that. Our children need to understand that living a godly life isn't always an easy one. They'll have to make choices, such as Moses did, and decide between the pleasures of this world or to follow Christ. Speak positively about living a Christian life, sure, but prepare them to make sacrifices. <clears throat> we need to admonish them to come out from among them, and be ye separate from unbelievers, as Paul did the Corinthians. And this admonition is the reason why we need to monitor who our children spend time with. <coughs> as my own boys, excuse me, <coughs> as my own boys became preteens and now teens, I began to understand the importance of surrounding them with Christian friends. <coughs> our children's our children need need friends their age. Our children needs friends their age. Why does that not sound right to me? Our children need friends their age, and we do. Um, and if we do not help, sorry. <laughs> if we do not help to provide the right group of friends, they're going to find their own. So as parents, we make sacrifices as well for our children's spiritual well-being. Sometimes that means driving two hours one way to take them to uh, a youth event or to a lock-in. Um, and sometimes that might even mean uprooting your family and moving somewhere where there's a congregation that's active. Um, I, you know, that's not what we want to do. We don't want to leave our church home that, that we feel like is home. But our children, their souls are important. And our children are the future of the church. And if they're not, if they don't feel like they're at home or, you know, uh, let's be honest. When our kids are small, other than the fact that we're making them get up and go to church, what is it about their own desires, why they want to go to church when they're young? 
They're friends. Thank you. They're friends, right? If they don't have any friends, guess what? It's just another boring thing that mom and dad is making us do. And their love for God is going to grow eventually through your teaching and through, the, through your faithfulness to worship. But something has to get them there in the first place, you know? Um, also, we need to understand that sacrifice is not equal to compromise. Um, <clears throat> in other words, <laughs> we don't want to compromise. Um, what am I saying here? I guess I could give a scenario. Um, we care about our children's well-being, and we want them to have friends, but not sacrifice the forsaking and the assembling for them to have friends. We don't skip worship, and we don't, you know, put the fact that we want them to have friends and be, um, you know, happy in this world over our... Um, a good example of that when I was raising my boys was travel ball. Yes. I mean, it was, well, we have a little service in the dugout before we play ball. Mm -hmm. And Matthew's a really good ball player and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was a meme on Facebook, and I can't, oh, it said, parents, don't worry about missing travel ball. I had your kids long before this. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I've, se I've seen that. That's. You know, that's funny because I was actually thinking about ball games and things like that. Um, <clears throat> because, you know, we do want our children to have a good life. We want them to have good experiences and, you know, um, but not to the detriment of their faith. Um, number two, a godly mother is going to model a genuine faith. So let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. In verse 15, speaking, <clears throat> wait, that's not right. Did I say that already? Okay, well, well, whatever the verse is, if somebody finds it, let me know. I'm sure I've got a one or two mixed around. But it talks about Eunice and Lois, Timothy's grandmother and his mother, that his faith was basically... 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1, 15 or 5? 5. Okay, I have... Okay. 2 Timothy 1, 5. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which first dwelt in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. So, Eunice and Lois had a genuine faith. The Greek word for genuine is... <clears throat> this is my Greek scholarship coming out. A new a a new a new That means sincere or unfeigned without hypocrisy. So what is it that constitutes a genuine faith? Acts chapter 16 and verse 1 describes Timothy Timothy's mother as a Jewish woman who was a believer. So we can rightly say that she was active and obedient in her faith since we, th since we see these uh, qualities in Timothy. It says his faith came through his mother in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 15. She taught him from childhood and because of her diligence, he firmly believed it. A genuine faith, faith is one that is free from hypocrisy. So many of our children leave the faith because of hypocrisy. When parents demand a thing from their children but it cannot be seen in their own lives. <clears throat> Our children are watchful, and they are learning even when we aren't speaking. 
A genuine faith lives and breathes what it teaches to the best of our ability. And that's the key word, to the best of our ability. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5 says that this sincere faith, unfeigned faith, dwelt first in his grandmother Lois. So we can see that a genuine faith is going to endure for generations. But on the opposite hand, we know that a lack of faith, a lack of knowledge, can also endure for generations. Look at the children of Israel. As the generations went on and on, they forgot God even more. But I am convinced that the opposite is true, that if we raise faithful children, we can raise more and more faithful children. And the reason I say that is because I was not raised in a godly home. My husband, you know... Things could have definitely been a little different for him, although he had more of a uh, godly background than I did. <clears throat> and I pray, but I also feel like, you know, we started here, we didn't do everything right, we're learning. But my kids are going to be able to take what they know from us and nurture that and cultivate that and add to it for their generation. And we can just continue to add to it. So the same way that a lack of knowledge can, you know, go through generations, I think that a faith can do the same thing. Um, and we don't want to lose sight of the fact that Timothy's father was a Greek, and we don't even really know if Timothy's father was a part of his life. He's never really mentioned other than the fact that he was a Greek. And so sometimes moms, when we feel like we're doing it all alone, we can still do it. Our children should be seeing us reading, praying, worshiping, and we need to insist that they do the same. Um, and that these things come, in our, come first in our lives and, and everything else must come second. <clears throat> A godly mother teaches her children humility. Perhaps one of the humblest people ever to be mentioned in Scripture was Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um... Turn to Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33. So beginning in verse 30, this is Mary. The angel came to her. It says, The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold... Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Um, think about this with me for a moment. <clears throat> you get pregnant in a miraculous way. I feel like, you know, if somebody was going to brag about something, that would be something to brag about, right? Not only that, but you were told in no uncertain terms that your child was going to save the world from their sins. Six months later, you go to visit your cousin who calls the child still in your womb Lord. You talking about having a big head, you know? Um, you know, when our kids do something great, we want to post it on Facebook and show everybody, right? Could you imagine being Mary and knowing what she knew and the humility that it took for her not to, you know, brag about it? It says, you know, it says that she hid these things in her heart. She didn't use it to her advantage. Um, if that's not humility, then I don't know what it, what is. And, you know, <clears throat> she knew her situation was special, but God knew the kind of woman that it was going to take to raise someone like Jesus, right? And it's interesting that um, God didn't humble her. Her humility didn't come because something God did. She already possessed humility, and God saw that in her, and that's what made her a good candidate. So... How can we show even a portion of the humility Mary did? 
I think that we should strive to be the kind of Christian that if the word were still being written today, that you'd be mentioned somewhere. And I'm not talking about for notoriety. I'm talking about to be an example to other Christians and to glorify God. And that, to me, is true humility. Humility is serving God and others for no reason other than to please him and to help build up his kingdom. Humility is knowing that you have the truth and that pearl of great price and not flaunting it, but rather sharing it with others. A godly mother spends time in prayer to God. One of the best examples we are giving we are given of a prayerful mother is of Hannah in 1 Samuel. Hannah's in great distress and anxiety because of, I'm going to probably butcher her name, Peninnah, her uh, husband's other wife, um, and she tormented her constantly. And we know that Hannah prayed for these things, prayed about all of this, and we don't know exactly what Hannah said in this prayer but we can know that she, didn't uh, that she didn't request anything unbecoming of a child of God. Um, turn with me to James chapter 4. <clears throat> Beginning in verse 1, it says... Um, from whence comes war, come wars and fightings among you? Come they, not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Yet lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight war and ye have not because ye ask not. I'm going to read the ESV. <laughs> what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So I feel like Hannah could have put herself right in this situation. Hannah desired and did not have, didn't she? But she didn't murder. She, she didn't covet the fact that Peninnah had children. Um, I mean, there's a difference between being wanting your own children and coveting someone else's. It says, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Did God answer Hannah's prayer? He did. So, based on what we read in James chapter 4, we know that she didn't ask amiss. She wasn't there saying, oh, please, please take Peninnah's joy away. Lessen her joy, right? She prayed for a son, and she prayed with the right understanding. Hannah herself said that she poured out her soul to the Lord. And then, what did she do? She went away and ate, and her countenance was sad no more. It's interesting because when I first read the account, when Eli tells Hannah, um, you know, your, uh, your petition be granted you. At first, I thought he was telling her, God is going to answer your prayers. God is, but what he's saying is, God bless you. Go forth. May God, may God bless you in your petition. He didn't tell her that her prayers were answered. Yet, she went away after she poured her heart out to God, and her countenance was sad in the morning and said she ate finally. So that tells me that she had an attitude that we should all have. She gave it to God. She gave it all to him. She poured her heart and soul out to him. And then she didn't worry about it anymore. Right? <clears throat> if you pray in such a way that you feel that you have poured out your soul to God, then you should be able to walk away confident that God heard your petition and your countenance should change too. No more worrying. No more anxiety. No more vexation. What an excellent example we are to our children when we, when we can give it all to God. Another thing about Hannah's prayer life is that um, I fully believe that it was her prayer life and her prayer habit that allowed her to give up Samuel. A consistent, thoughtful prayer life shows that we trust God to see us through whatever life brings us. <clears throat> and it would be extremely neglectful 
to not acknowledge Hannah's prayer of thankfulness and praise in First in First Samuel chapter two. Um, and may we never neglect to thank God for our answered prayers, big and small. Speaking of prayer, in Ephesians chapter 6, 11 through 17, we talk about the armor of God. We teach our children the armor of God in order to stand against the wiles of the devil. This is why we wear this armor. But how often do we stop at verse 17 and we never continue on to verse 18? Verse 18 admonishes us to pray and watch. That's part of the armor of God, isn't it? It's not given some specific, you know, weapon. But some would say that the prayer and watchfulness would be the nuts and bolts that are holding the armor together. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer is powerful and a privilege for Christians, and we need to model that for our children. A godly mother is a servant. Take the Proverbs 31 mother. She was a mother, wasn't she? She worked hard to help provide for her family. She helps the poor and the needy. Do our children get to witness our service? If not, they should. They should be involved. We do not serve to be seen of men, but we do want to be an example for our children. So what do we do when our children are young? Do we let them help us bake cookies for someone who needs encouragement? Even though what might take 15 minutes normally <laughs> takes, you know, a lot longer. <laughs> do we sit down with them and make cards and draw pictures for somebody who's been sick? We need to involve them in our benevolence and our hospitality, right? So does anybody, has anybody ever done this with your children? You say yes. What kind of things have you done with your children? One thing that we did was when we were in charge of bulletin boards in mm -hmm. the church, and they would come and they would help us. They would be our donors. They would go get certain things, and they just felt like they were doing the bulletin board with us. We right. We always took them with us. We didn't leave them at home with a sitter or anything. We just brought them to the building and as we worked. That's right. That's right. Um, anybody else want to share something, a good idea that you could do for, with, with younger kids? Um, it, when, I'm, when my kids were little, even, we would take them door knocking with us. Number one, it puts people who are answering the door at ease a little. <laughs> they're, they're less likely to be hostile when you knock on their door. Um, but also, you know, if they can walk, you know, then they can, they can work. You know, that's, I mean, I'm not saying child labor or anything, but, you know, um, it takes sacrifice. It's all about sacrifice, right? And they need to start learning that when they're small. What about when they get older, when they're teenagers and they're 15 and they're 18, like my boys? How do we teach them to serve God at that age? Does it, does it stop? No? Um, so as they get older, one thing that we can do and that I do is volunteer them for yard work for a widow or somebody who's elderly. Um, we have them accompany us when we visit people. Um, and they come with us when we go on Bible studies. If they don't want to talk, that's fine, but they can help find scripture. They can read scripture. Um, there's no reason why they can't do those things, and they ought to be coming with you. How else are they going to learn how to study the Bible with people if they don't see it being done? We don't normally, children in the church, we don't normally study the Bible with them um, if we're doing a Bible study for the end result of, you know, salvation. It's going to be a little different because they're taught their whole life. You know, it's not, we're not going to sit down and, and um, the same way we would if we were studying with someone who you know, isn't a member of the church already, right? So unless they see that and get to participate in that, they're not really going to know how to do it. And that, you know, we all know that. Who's ever gone into a Bible study, never done one before, um, and felt confident about it? Or never sitting in one or, or anything, you know? You're not going to feel confident, so why would we set our kids up to, you know, this is what we expect of you, but I know you've never seen it done, you know? 
When they get old enough to serve on their own, they're going to know exactly what to do and how to do it. They're going to learn to recognize and seek out opportunities to serve the church on their own. And <clears throat> something interesting that you said, Kathy, is that, you know, whenever they're, um, you know, doing the bulletin, they didn't do necessarily the bulk of the work. They would run and get things and that sort of thing. But we need to teach them that no job is too small. We need to teach them not to have the attitude of Naaman that if it's not some big great thing, then we're not going to do it, right? So even being a gopher, go get this, is serving the Lord. No act of service is too small or insignificant. A godly mother is wise. Proverbs 31.26 of the virtuous mother says that she opens her mouth with wisdom. So what constitutes a wise mother? A wise mother is practical, she's straightforward, she's not naive, and she's just. Proverbs is full of practical wisdom from parents, and I especially love the passage in Proverbs, um, Proverbs 23, particularly about uh, drinking alcohol. So let's turn to Proverbs chapter 23, and we're going to kind of read that together. so many versions in front of me that now I'm like, which one do I want to read? <laughs> um, let's see. Alright. Starting in verse 30. Proverbs 20... Proverbs chapter 23, verse 30. They that tarry long at the wine, they that go seek mixed wine, look, thou, look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it gives color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. So most of the time our admonition to stay away from things like alcohol might stop here. It's just not good for you. We shouldn't do it. It's not, it's not pleasing to God. But we also need to make sure our kids truly understand the consequences of these things. That, to me, is important. You need to put an image in their mind of what, kind of what, what sin can do to them. Um, verse 23, Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thy heart shall utter perverse things. You're going to do things. You're going to say things. You're going to act in ways that you would not normally do. When you're under the influence of alcohol is what, is what they're saying. Yet thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. It makes you dizzy. You're going to feel bad. Not, have you ever been seasick? Mm -hmm. Imagine being at the top of the mast. I mean, the, the waves, you're not feeling hardly anything down there. So it, it, he's saying it's going to make you feel terrible. Uh, verse 35, they have stricken me. Thou shalt say, I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. So he's saying it makes you numb. It numbs your pain. It numbs your emotions. And that is the addictive part. So you're going to wake up, oh, I want to feel that thing again. Okay, so they go, they, she goes through addiction, um, all the stupid things, and that's the only word I can come up with that alcohol makes you do. This is what we need to teach our kids. Don't stop it just because I said so, just because it's, it's not right. Why is it not right? What does it do? What, how can it affect your life? The application here is that in our teachings we have to be straightforward. Some say that we should shelter our kids from the bad things that happen in this world, but I believe, this is my opinion, that, the very, that this is the very reason why our kids are letting so much temptation overtake them is because they don't truly understand the consequences. Uh, we had a family friend uh, who was a recovering alcoholic. She's passed away now. 
Um, my kids loved her to death. She was so good to my kids. But um, she relapsed and started making some really, really terrible decisions. And, um, you know, and my kids weren't allowed to be around her anymore. Well, you know, naturally the kids want to know, why aren't we going to see so-and-so? Why have we not talked to so-and-so? So what can I do? I have the option of saying, well, you know, she's made some bad choices, um, and, you know, we're just not going to do that. No, to me, Chuck and I wanted our kids to understand what addiction does, what alcohol can do to a person. At the same time explaining that she's not a bad person. And I can promise you that people that make bad decisions and people that are addicted, they don't want to be addicted. They're not bad people. But that's how addiction can overtake your life, is that you do things that you don't want to do. And I wanted my kids to understand that. And some people, you know, kind of ridiculed us for that. Um, but they need to know the harsh realities of what temptation can do. <clears throat> Not only do we need to be honest with them, but we need to give them practical advice on how to avoid temptations. Um, go through scenarios, practice scenarios with them. And that might sound silly, but, you know, when they're at school, don't they do fire drills and tornado drills? They're even um, doing drills for uh, gunmen in the school, right? We teach them defensive driving. We give them swimming lessons. All these things, these are for their physical well-being. Why are we not going through scenarios and practicing and teaching them how to avoid temptation for their spiritual well-being? Is that, are their souls not at stake? So it's not, it won't be silly to go through practice scenarios. Part of having wisdom as a mother is not being naive. What I mean by that is never assume you know everything about your children. Never assume you know anything about your children. Never believe everything your children tell you. Um, another little side story here is when I was growing up, I had a friend. Um, she's also passed away now just because of the circumstances of the way she lived her life. Um, but uh, we went to a school dance. And you know what happens at school dances. And she came home with a hickey because she made out with a friend, a guy. And we were in fifth grade, mind you. And her mom and my mom were out working in the, in the garden. And her mom noticed this, on, this, you know, on her neck there. And she told her mom, asked what it was. She told her mom that someone had brought a baseball bat to the dance the night before and someone had hit her with this baseball bat. And her mom believed her. And my mom looked at me with fire in her eyes like, you know, I don't believe a word of that, right? And we had to talk afterwards. But she never got in trouble for that. Her mom, I don't, I don't, I don't know if her mom truly believed that or if she was just in denial and didn't want to take care of it or whatever. But um, we can't be naive like that. That is silly. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's things like that, her mother overlooking for whatever reason, things like that, is why she's not here today. Um, there's a huge difference in trusting that your children truly want to make the right choices, because I think that, I think that they do. Um, but there's a difference between that and trusting that their under, underdeveloped minds and untrained emotions are going to be able to overcome those temptations. My kids take it personally when I say I don't trust them. Because when I say, if I just say I don't trust them, they take it personally. Um, but you have to let them know that it isn't, their, it isn't their will or desire that you don't trust, but it's you and science um, that you realize that it's harder for them to make the right decisions that are best for them. And it's your job as a parent to protect them from the potential harmful and temptation situations. And it's not a personal attack on them. And, I, you know, I don't think they're ever too young to understand, you know, it's not your desire I don't trust. It's your ability of your brain to make the right and, and reason through the consequences. Um, too often we send our kids to their room with internet capable cell phones. We allow them to close their doors while they're on their computers. They play video games with their headsets on and chat online with people they don't know. And we never check up on them. 
My kids are Christian. They never, they know better. That's what we want to tell ourselves, right? If you are not periodically checking browser and search history, text messages, online game chats, emails, then you're missing an opportunity. Never stop questioning your children about what they're doing, reading, texting, listening to, where they're going. It's our business to be in their business. It is our right and our obligation to be in their business. And if they know that you're going to ask them about what they've been doing, they're going to be far less likely to do it because they either don't want to have to hide it, explain it, or lie about it. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 tells us to train up a child in the way that he should go. While they are young, we are preparing the ground, their hearts, to love and seek the Lord. As godly mothers, we are constantly planting seeds, but at the same time, the world is planting seeds. And at some point, our children are going to have to decide which seeds, which seeds they're going to cultivate. This can be extremely scary for parents, but if our children have had the blessing of a godly mother who instill them, who instill in them the importance of a genuine faith in Christ, exhibited a strong prayer life, made wise decisions, and had the attitude of a servant, then we have certainly given them a solid foundation in which to build their faith upon. No mother is going to do everything right, and God doesn't expect perfection from us. He desires our faithfulness and our sacrifices. Raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord takes effort, but our time with them is so short. So then walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Be ye not unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Thank you.